Hello and welcome back to the Timeline Astrology Podcast with myself, Gary O'Toole, and my guest today, Barry Rosen. Barry has been with me on the podcast before. We spoke about Saturn's entry into Sidereal Capricorn back in 2020. And this podcast, it's all about financial astrology. So Barry is an expert in financial astrology. He's been practicing astrology since 1987 and has been involved in Vedic culture since 1973. So he's been at it for some time. He's written five books um, and he teaches classes in investment astrology, especially since 1990. In recent years, he's developed more of an interest in psychological and in-depth astrology, as well as the spiritual dimensions of astrology. But today's conversation is all about finances. So without further ado, here's Barry. Good to be here, Gary. It's been a while since I've been on, but it's good to, good to be back. Actually, now that you say that, I'm, I'm remembering that the last time you were on was when we spoke about Saturn and Capricorn. Isn't that interesting? Because right. it's about to go back. Yeah, yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I just thought of that. Wow, okay. So, well, we are talking about Saturn-type themes in a way and Capricorn kind of long-term projections in a way when we're talking about wealth and um, building up wealth and, and also taking away wealth <laughs> right. and what is possible right now. Um, but I think people need to hear... Um, this about financial astrology um, in that you know there are other perspectives that we can have on finances and we can look at the astrology in the long-term projections and all of that but also starting with this concept of Lakshmi the goddess of wealth and prosperity and actually what is wealth right um this is something that's kind of fascinating people sometimes want to pigeonhole wealth into how much money you have in your bank account and in, in, in the traditional Vedic tradition, um, Lakshmi has kind of, there are eight Lakshmis. And if you, there's a picture of kind of eight Lakshmis and you can, um, so the, the, we have wealth as material comfort and you meet people sometimes that have inherited money from their family, but the, none of the rest of their life works, you know? So they, are they wealthy, you know? Um, so that's, it's only one form of wealth is how much money you have in the bank. And then wealth is health because unless we, um, you know, if we have lots of, you know, meet people too that, you know, they have billions of dollars, but, you know, they're, have some chronic illness and, and they can't, they can't function, you know, and so um, what, what good is it, you know, so health, having your health is really an important part of wealth. Um, traditionally, food um, and store, um, storing, be able to have food is, is a, a form of wealth. When you think of farmers, they, they, and I work with a lot of farmers and they're very wealthy because they have, you know, they grow a lot and they store it and they usually have, you know, huge assets because they keep, they, you know, they hold on to, to on to their wealth. And so people forget uh, how much money you hold on to, even in terms of food is kind of important. Um, and then there's another aspect of Lakshmi connected to success. Are you able to kind of fulfill your desires? I mean, a lot of people, you know, I don't, um, I mean, a lot of people that, you know, nothing in their life works, they go to start a business, um, and it fails, and they start another business, they just they don't have that aspect of wealth. And there's some people that anything they touch, succeeds. So wealth is success. Um, wealth is courage. Also, you've got to have like the courage to um, I mean, there's some people that are really timid, they're afraid to try anything, you know, so like, when they can't cower in the house, oh, my chart's doomed, I'm not going to do anything. So you have to have the ability to to like get out there and be great. And, and if you don't have courage, you know, then you don't, it's another form of wealth. And uh, friendship is an important form of wealth also, because um, sometimes you, if you have a lot of friends in your life and they're supportive, and even if things get bad, I mean, your friends are there supporting you with food and comfort and things like that. And, and our friendship and our, our friendliness and our the people in our lives is an important aspect of wealth. And then one of the highest forms of wealth is um, a spiritual aspect, which is knowledge of the self. Do you know, if we don't remember that we come to come from God and we're here to return to God, um, then, you know, all the money we accumulate in the world and all the success we have may not mean anything if we don't, we're not kind and compassionate, we don't help others, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that's pretty interesting. I'm, I was just thinking about when you were speaking about friendships, how we can tie that in with the 11th house itself of game right. the more fingers you have and the more pies in a way right it's the more people you're connected to the more you have access to different things like you hear about that job that someone oh 
networking yeah, networking right networking is 11th house yeah are you a good networker do you have a lot of friends to network with and everything will help happens for you that's good an aspect just of like work. the support aspect that you mentioned there is so crucial right yeah yeah so um so that's material wealth that's health is your wealth uh food success courage um courage is a big one i think as well in terms of people taking on risks and you know ventures like financial risks right right yeah i mean even when i started my investment newsletter many years ago it was like it was kind of a new area for me and it was like i somehow i you know if i knew what i know now i never would have done it but i just had a lot of innocent courage to go forth and kept moving with it and you know it did succeed you know i've been had my investment letter now for 35 years now speaking of that because you you told me that you do a twice daily investment and trading newsletter on fortunecast.com so that that's that seems like a lot so people are getting like up-to-date reports every right day. i mean the markets move very quickly i mean you know you know and you know on the other other night crude oil was trading at 111 dollars a barrel and then suddenly it was trading at 97 and then it went to 95 you know so like you know if you're if you're in the commercial end of the business particularly you know those are huge moves and if you know there are people that like to speculate on those moves but um originally the industry was developed to hedge risk because you know if you if you're uh if you're uh a Her if you hershey's chocolate and the price of cocoa fluctuates um because of a drought or something and you've priced you haven't priced it in and protected yourself then you know you're you can't manage your 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 business very well so the whole investment industry and you know mortgage rates interest rates you know everything you know it's, it's a huge industry i mean it's just you know trillions and trillions of dollars you know the, uh, that we're talking about and so um okay, so i can understand why yeah people need to be on top of that re like really on top of it so if people are interested in that and they, they don't already follow you and they don't get your reports it's fortucast.com that's f-o-r-t-u-c-a st dot com, yeah. and, and I mean, there's different levels of there are people who are like etf traders or people who trade um you know funds if you want to trade sectors you know like the energy sector has done really well this year because um and we we got into a long time ago and you know it, the prices of energy and stocks kind of doubled you know so it's kind of sometimes finding the be best sectors even if, it's, if the market's bad and so that's what we do in one of our products and then we cover like gold and silver and cryptos and stock indices and the dollar index currency markets a huge thing and um crude oil prices natural gas all those things we cover yeah okay so like coming to the the topic i guess of our discussion today really is that you obviously use astrology alongside your forecasts right um your financial forecasts right so but you also work with people individually reading people's charts and looking at their wealth in their chart the potential for wealth in their chart and how to increase that potential as well right so let's maybe start with the basics of when you approach it with the astrology and the base basically the abcs of astrology the planet signs and houses what are the planets signs and houses from a basic point of view now, because I know you're not going to be able to go into this like really in depth, but the basics of the ABCs of financial astrology. Okay. So um, first of all, we have the planets that kind of expand, um, which are Jupiter. You know, if you put Jupiter in the first house, you tend to be fat or you have trouble holding, you know, gaining weight. And Venus is also a planet of expansion. She likes to buy. And so always looking at those planets and those planets can get out of balance sometimes too sometimes you get people um you know and then we've got the planet mars which kind of governs risk taking so if you're going to be if you're going to have any ability to invest in stocks and increase your portfolio or take a risk in your life to improve your life you usually have to have a strong mars otherwise you're going to be too afraid to go out of the house and you know do anything and you may just cower in a job that makes you unhappy um Mercury um, is, is you know, Mercury actually governs shares of stocks. Um, and so I, I find that Virgos and Geminis often are very attracted to investing in stocks because people invest in things that their own nature. Um, and, and, and stock market was very quickly, people are just kind of trading. So Mercury is the businessman that governs trading, you know. Can I ask about that point then? Because it's like, you yeah. know, obviously Mercury is very changeable. Like it's the fastest moving planet apart from the moon, of course. So is that also why there's that sort of maybe excitement from trading is it almost like gambling yeah yeah 
And Rahu, that brings into Rahu, Rahu's the gambler. It's, it's, if you have Rahu in the fifth house, the house of investment, you have to tell people not to gamble. And you find, I get these people coming to me and they have Rahu in the fifth house and they just, you know, the, the problem, there's a difference between investing and gambling. And this is an important point for your readers. Investing is a very sophic part of, of our life. We build our wealth and accumulate money in our second house so that when we retire, we have money in the bank and we can live off our savings. And everybody has to learn how to do that. People have stopped having the ability to kind of save money and have it there. And, you know, just because they, the world has encouraged debt and credit cards and people have more debt than they have savings. Um, and it's important, no matter how, how much money you have or, or earn, you always have to save something. Even if you take $10 a week or $20 a week, you always have to put some money because you're telling the universe you want to accumulate you want to create wealth, you want to build up your second house. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, um, but yeah, gambling, I, I, I have a segue here, I'm sorry, the um, uh, K2 kind of can take things away, usually. <laughs> Rahu kind of can give, Rahu can give a lot of money, but can also get you in trouble because it can take it away after it gives it to you. So you know, whenever you're in a Rahu or K2 period, you know, you can have huge ups and downs in, in finances. You have to prepare for it. If you go into a Rahu period, you should be, if you know you're going into a Rahu period, you should make sure you have enough savings because something's going to happen and it could suddenly disappear. Depending, you know, these, these are all very specific split houses and, you know, Gary, Gary knows this stuff, but um, it's, it's very complicated. Um, in Saturn, terms of the luminaries, before you get to Saturn, what, what would you say about the luminaries, the sun and moon? Well, the moon, you know, the moon, the, the, the sun and the moon are obviously the most important part of the chart. If, if they don't, you know, we should always study them the most whenever we look at any chart. Um, and um, the, I was, the moon is, is very connected to wealth and always connected to, to food, you know, and sustenance. And, and um, so I find uh, the moon's very important. I mean, um, you know, we, we like, you know, moon in the second is, it's just really wonderful. Um, moon in the second house is wonderful for being able to have money and hold on to it um, and things like that. Um, uh, the sun, you know, the sun is, is often the kind of the confidence and, and courage that we've gotten our, from our father. And, and if our son, if, if the sun, you know, if we didn't have a good relationship with our father and our son is weak in the 12th house, um, sometimes we don't have the confidence just, just to move up in life. So I think, I think doing anything in life uh, is so connected to the sun and the sun has a lot to do with government and leadership of course and leo and things like that but um and then and then finally saturn of course saturn, saturn can you know saturn gets a bad rap i mean saturn certainly can take away certain rising signs um particularly taurus and and um Cap you know uh, taurus and libra and, and capricorn and aquarius but obviously you know that's the best planet for them and the, Saturn is the Saturn is a businessman, you know, he, you know, he really is, he's, he, 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 he governs infrastructure. And um, in that sense, he's, um, he's very important for the building material life, you know, he doesn't just kind of take away, he kind of just, um, he, he kind of is, 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 you know, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, and with Saturn, it's, it's, you know, people want to get rich quick with Rahu, and that doesn't work. That's gambling Saturn. Saturn's telling you save even Saturn in the second house. You know, if, if it's not really afflicted, you might be good at saving money. You're very frugal. You know, you've got to hold on to your money. You don't have a lot of it, and you get you. You know, you actually by the time you retire, you have a nest egg because you spent your whole life holding on to it. So Saturn doesn't always, um, you know, isn't isn't the bad guy that is, people make him out to be. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I think he's a, I think he's a, I think he's you know he goes with Mercury quite well. He's a good business person and and. Um, Capricorn is is the tenth house. It's it's a it's a business sign, and and I think Saturn has a lot to do with business. I think that's a good uh, point, and people need to hear that. You know, with Saturn being the, the slow and steady wins the race sort of thing, like you say, putting money aside uh, bit by bit. You know, you get there, maybe as opposed to sort of overnight windfall with the Rahu, which comes and goes. You know, or Jupiter, where you might you know be very. Um, sort of biting off more than you can chew kind of thing and then you know getting getting yourself into situations you're, you're beginning to sound like my mother <laughs> <laughs> okay like, uh, you know slow and steady a little bit every week you know you know i've never and i've never listened to her by the way um on, on that topic anyway 
Okay, so that's the planets. Now the signs. What uh, what signs would you highlight? And, and we could tie that in, I guess, with the houses as well. The, the particular right. Houses. Well, let's, yeah, we can do that. Um, so Taurus, you know, is obviously connected to banking and it's natural second sign of the zodiac. So it's about accumulating and storing. And so you you know if you if you have if you have you know Taurus is very important for kind of holding on to things. And the nature of Taurus, as you know, is it's going to it holds on to stuff. And the, one of the problems with Taurus is it may be not generous enough and it gets too greedy and it gets into trouble. It holds on to its weight to put Jupiter and Taurus or something. It just can't let go of stuff. So, um, so Taurus is important. Um, Aries to me is this very kind of creative. It's connected to, you know, the military and athletic industries, um, um, just obviously to sports and to, to, um, military but it's also a, a very kind of marketing sign it's very connected to um i find i find if people have a lot of areas that are really the key word is creative they have to they have to keep creating um gemini um you know obviously is connected to kind of um um, communications. I mean, it used to be connected to like telephones and telegraphs and things like that and writing and publishing, and it still is connected to all those things. And now it's kind of taken over a little bit with, you know, blogging and internet blogging and podcasting and radio broadcasts. And, and you know, Aquarius gets in there a little bit too, the air signs. Um, cancer is a very kind of obviously food oriented sign, um, connected to, very connected to agriculture. Um, it's this in Vedic astrology, it's the sign of agriculture. And that's why the moon's so important for agriculture. And a lot of farmers, you know, have uh, moon's very important. And that's why the, it's food. I mean, moon is, is agriculture. Uh, sun for, you know, banking and leadership and investment. Natural fifth sign of the zodiac is going to be connected to, you know, you do find a lot of people that are Leo get very involved in the stock market and investing and speculating because it's the natural fifth sign of the zodiac. Um, Virgo, you know, health industry, um, service industry, you know, obviously, um, it's very, um, I, I, I always find that Virgo is connected to people. I mean, I get tracked to a lot of people who are into healing and massage and things like that. And Virgo is, you know, has that, so much of that quality, but it, it's an accounting, it's also an accounting sign and very connected to, to you know, business and, and stuff like that. Libra, um, of course, could be connected to the to the arts and beauty, but it's also, Libra's a good marketing person. Um, Libras, I find, are very, um, um, they're good salespeople, they're good at marketing and networking and relating, and, and they're often in PR or HR and things like that. They're very good with that. Um, Scorpio is a research sign. Um, maybe it's connected to the chemical industry. It's certainly connected to psychologists and, and um, astrologers and people who become Vedic, you know, um, spiritual teachers. Sagittarius is the bow and arrow sign. It's the, it's, it's, it's the only sign of the zodiac connected to the military. Um, and we forget that the United States is a, a Sagittarius and it's been at war, you know, since the beginning, there's only 10 years or something that it wasn't in some kind of war. It's just, its nature is to be at war, Sag. But it's a very expansive philosophical sign and Capricorn, again, a good business sign. Um, and, and, you know, natural 10th sign of the Zodiac, very connected to, um, got a lot of good business people. And Saturn, you know, Saturn is a business planet. I, I've, people forget about that, Capricorn. And then Aquarius, um, I find a lot of biotech is connected to there. It's got, it's got um, Sadabishak Nakshatra, which is the, you know, 100 healers, 100 doctors, a lot of, a lot of healing people in there, obviously you know, new age communications, internet, electronics, and all the, all the high-tech computer people in there, and Pisces, um, you know, Pisces is a funny sign, we've got, <laughs> Pisces is the 12th sign of the zodiac, so it actually governs hospitals, and mental institutions, and, and breweries, and, you know, places of intoxication, and, and it sometimes it gives this kind of illusionary, you know, it's, it's connected to moksha, it wants to remind us to, sometimes we'll take everything away, in order to remind us that, uh, you know, we're here to find God, the 12th house. So getting into houses specifically, um, um, you know, I think all the houses are connected to, to, to money, you know, on some level. So the first, the first house is our intelligence. Are we intelligent 
do, do we have our, the intelligence to make good decisions about money and to stay healthy and to do good things for ourselves and, you know, things like that. If the first house isn't working, then, you know, nothing else works usually, you know, but second house is, is connected to family and saving. So the fifth house is really, it's not about income. Some people think the second house is income, but second house is about, it's storage. It's that aspect of Lakshmi about food and storage and family. Do we have family money? Do we have the ability to store and hold on to money? Um, K2 doesn't like being in the second house. It's the worst planet to have in the second house, but Saturn normally wouldn't be good there, but it may be frugal and hold on to it. You know, Jupiter and Venus do, and the moon do really well in the, in the, um, in the second house. Mars may have problems with addictive patterns from family. It was, Mars had a rough family life in the second house and you know, it may, it may, depending on what sign and what aspects are there, you know, it may have some problems. Um, third house is again, courage and entrepreneurial energy. Um, if you're going to be in business for yourself, you usually need a good, third house you usually need jupiter or venus or or the moon in the third house um those are good plans to have to be able to be in business for yourself and have the courage to be successful in business there's a yoga for being in business for yourself the asamati yoga um and you have to have i think it's venus jupiter mercury or the moon in the third sixth 10th or 11th houses if you have any of those then you can have be in business for yourself um fourth house is not necessarily home and and uh property although that's some, traditionally some people talk about that um fifth house is the house of investment um in, um, in, in financial trade sixth house is the house of debt um we don't like mars in the sixth house because it's it's the karka in its own house it tends to be particularly good at accumulating debts um um, seventh house partnership, so business partnership in this case would be important aside from marriage. Eighth house is money from partnerships. So is it money from marriage? I mean, sometimes you may have a horrible ability to make money from your own chart, but if you have like Jupiter or Venus in the eighth house that you, you know, or something, you may have a lot of a benefic in the eighth house. You may have a lot of money from from a partner partner eighth house is also inheritance so uh, you want a, a good benefics in the eighth house um will will lead to a good inheritance if you have other things going on in your chart ninth house is the house of general good luck and good fortune um you know it's just it's just it's baga it, it's connected to you know how much luck you have in your life uh 10th house is you know status and 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 work um it, but it's not uh, here's here's the problem. People think tenth house is work. I I I think, uh, I think, first of all, I think sixth house is everyday work. It's, it, and if you if your tenth house is stronger than your sixth house, and you have some of those yogas for being in business for yourself, you might be in business for yourself and be a boss. You know and that would show up more strongly with a stronger tenth house. I I think the um, you know I I don't even like to, and when people ask me about what work they should do. I don't, I don't think the 10th house is the answer. I mean, one of the things that I learned was that planets in the 10th house show us our attitude about work. If you have a lot of difficult planets in the 10th house, you, you actually, you, you know, particularly K2 or Saturn or something like that, you may be miserable of how you feel at work. So 10th house is not even, uh, we'll have to look at a rudest or at least, you know, there are other things that you really have to look at to judge. I think the 11th house is not income older than in a minute. It's, it's a house of friends and fulfillment of desires. And um, you would not look at it for income. We're going to have to look at a nut, something else for that. Um, but it, it is like the house of networking. So if you have a lot of friends, they help you network, then, you know, that's, that can contribute to your wealth. And 12th house is obviously expenditures, um, um, to be foreign investment too. So, I want to just highlight something that I was uh, just taking notes while you were talking about the houses and just to draw into sort of the present moment and how we're having these transits right now that would um, reflect some of these things that you've been mentioning. So, for example, you mentioned about Rahu, um, you mentioned Ketu and their different um, expressions for wealth, perhaps the sign Taurus and how that is all about stored wealth and how we could connect that with the moon as well. There are some astrologers that give the moon co-rulership alongside Venus. Venus is in Taurus, in sidereal Taurus right now, um, and it's aspected by Rahu. So, you know, you could just kind of draw conclusions from that alone, that there are some issues with finances right now. 
Um, the other thing I've noted is that actually uh, Ketu by transit is in Libra, right? It's Venus's other sign. You've got Taurus and Libra, but it's in the ninth division of Taurus in June, July, and August. So I thought that was really interesting how the transits are pointing to this kind of like, as you mentioned, Ketu in the second house is the worst place to put Ketu where it's in Taurus right now, we could correlate with the second house and how that is really showing this lack of stability in the world. So I just want to kind of tie those in together because um, obviously you're talking about people's charts and, and in general, these houses, these planet signs and houses form all sorts of different configurations in someone's chart and also by transit at the time to influence that configuration in their chart. So it's kind of like an ongoing dynamic experience, right? Right. And, you know, I do think, I mean, this has, you know, originally people thought Jupiter and Pisces would be wonderful and everything would be rosy and everything would be wonderful. But, you know, Pisces has that other quality to it because it's the 12th sign of the Zodiac. And it's kind of, you know, I, and I think this Saturn, uh, we still really started having trouble with the stock market when we had Saturn squaring um, a 10th house aspect to K2 and Libra. And it's still kind of continuing its close, even though Saturn's in Aquarius, it's really still pretty close to having a very strong aspect to K2. And so and that's going to continue as it goes into Capricorn, retrograding to Capricorn. So I think that's kind of one of the elephants in the room that people aren't noticing is that kind of K2 just is one of those more difficult um, configurations that kind of blows up things and makes things not work. And then you kind of are forced to look for God. And if you don't look for God, then you, you kind of get into trouble because you, you're caught up in thinking life is my, my, my 401k account and life is my bank account and life is, you know, um, you know, whether I can afford to buy gas to, you know, to, to drive across country or something like that. And when those things get upset, um, people are turned to God. I'll, I'll tell you an important story. When I was um, in the 1974-1975, it's a bad year um, um, in, the, in the U.S. You know, we had the gas crisis and um, the stock market fell 50% and, you know, people were losing jobs. And a lot of people at that time, I was teaching uh, meditation at that time, and people were flocking to the meditation centers because their material essence um, but the things they counted on, you know, their bank account and their ability to buy things, you know, was just, you know, a mess. And um, they, they started looking for spiritual answers. And I think what good can come out of all the things that are happening now is, is that we have to remember that the material world is always changing and it's changing more so than you can imagine. And, and um, more, you know, and, and, you know, even this, this Jupiter and Pisces thing, it's reminding us to kind of turn to God and spirituality now when, when our material life is not working. And um, you make a really, that's really well said, Barry, and you make a really good point there. And Barry was talking there about Saturn returning to Capricorn. Just a reminder that we're speaking of the sidereal zodiac. So Saturn will return to Capricorn by mid-July until January 2023. And while it's in Capricorn, it aspects Libra by 10th house aspect, a square aspect where Ketu is transiting. So those two, Saturn and Ketu, tend to remove things. And of course, Libra are connected again to sort of even just social life, you know, being impacted by our ability to spend and so on, you know. Um, now, let's, I think we should talk about Aruda right now because, you know, as you say, you know, the 11th house isn't earnings. It's more about friendships and networks and, and gains of other kinds, perhaps. But if you're talking about money, actual physical money, the concept of Ruda, I think, is important, which could be translated as attainment is one word that I've read out for Aruda. And, and attainment in a spiritual sense is where I came across Aruda, not necessarily in a financial sense but you can still use it for that. So maybe explain a bit more about, and you don't have to explain the calculation. It might confuse listeners right. who can't see it working in a, in a chart, but maybe just explain uh, about the concept just uh, briefly and just basics of Aruda. Okay. So um, Aruda is again, represent the most manifest level of material of the material world. And, and you know, they're kind of illusionary on some level. And they used to, I used to, get confused because they used to say Aruda was about illusion or people perceived us or something like that. But Aruda is, Arudas are very real. I mean, if you have Jupiter in your, if, in, if you're a rule log now, you see, so we have a, we have a, we have a rise, we have a rising sun and then we have how people see us. Okay. So, um, 
my my um it's, it's a complicated calculation you know i'm scorpio rising but my root logna is pisces with sun in the first house so people see me as kind of a spiritual teacher and leader and that's very true i mean and that's how people see me they always look up to me that way um you have jupiter you know in your conjunct your logna people see you as a teacher they're drawn to you if you have, you have rahu conjunct your logna you know the people think you're a crook i mean a friend who or I had a colleague and he, he just was very unsuccessful because he had Rahu conjunct his Urulaga and, there, and he, he looked like a, a crook and actually he got cast in movies um, playing gangsters, you know, but he couldn't, he couldn't make it in other realms because people perceived him. So Arudas are sometimes called perception, but perceptions are very real, you know, um, and so there, there are Arudas for every house and uh, until maybe three or four years ago, I didn't really understand this. Domini astrology helped me understand it. And so they're, uh, and they, they have abbreviations. So like, um, so when you're, when you're trying to, when people ask me, well, what should I make do for a living? What will bring the most money to me? Um, I was taught that to look at the 11th house from the Rural Agnes to see what sign is there and what planets are there. And that will give us more information about how you, what what you what the chart is how the chart is going to help you make a living more um if you're looking at um and there are rudas for everything so it turns out like people want to ask if they want to buy a house well the fourth house yeah you know, may have something to do with buying a house but but uh, the timing of it may be connected to the a4 which is the aruda of the fourth house which may be completely elsewhere so jupiter conjunct the A4 in transit or a, a cycle connected to that may help time the buying of a house better than just looking at the fourth house. So um, a root is, um, and the A2 is really actually your, your, how much money you really have in the bank. The second house may be your relationship with your attitude about money, about your, your physical, uh, your relationship with your family, how your family connected you to money. But the A2 which may be in a different place is actually maybe your savings. And so somebody, you may think somebody's wealthy and then their A2 is conjunct Saturn or K2 or something. And you talk to them and say, I haven't been able to save any money, you know, you know, so it's kind of, you know, it, it, um, astrology gets very complicated, but for those of you who know astrology, you know, there's a whole new realm of the material world that you have to look at in Vedic astrology in the Arudas. And it, it, it's just much more revealing. And, and it's much more practical, actually, because when you think about it, when we speak about houses and areas of life and concepts about these different things, they are mostly concepts in our head. Like we talk about the third house, it's like there's this kind of inner sense of courage, but like you can't see courage. Right. right? You could see the results of someone's courage through their enterprise and they start this business. And that then we're going to be looking at more Aruda, the things that have manifested in their life based on how they apply that courage. Right. So that's really what it is, isn't it? It's like where the third house is, where the ruler of the third house is gone. And the same again shows the reflection of that. So the end result is they are starting a new enterprise, right? Or money that's gained in the 11th from the Aruda or whatever it might be. So it is a bit more complex because you're actually adding in 12 more houses in a sense or 12 more things to look at on top of the 12 houses itself. But it actually makes more sense when you do it. So that's, I think that's clear. And, and of course, the whole reason I'm mentioning all of that, as you mentioned, again, 11th from Aruda is a really important one for looking at actual earnings, how you're going to earn, where you can earn more money, right? Right, right. So that's good because um, when I look at my chart and I see where that is and how Venus is involved, all Venus type activities in my life always um, help me earn more money. That's always been the case. Um, so let's talk about now how you would put that all together <laughs> if in right. as simple as you can, because I know it's very complex. Yeah, people's people's charts are very complicated. And um so let's, what, let's just ask about how would you very like and you can be as exaggerated as you want here, just so people can get a sense of it. How would you approach a chart and see how if somebody is going to be financially successful? Okay. So it depends. Um you know, I think time, you know, timing is everything. And so the first thing I always look at when I do a chart is what dasha period you're in and what site, you know, what, what's the cycle that you're running? I mean, sometimes, you know, people, you know, 
people, you go to an astrologer who doesn't know much, a friend, and he says, oh, you've got all this money in your chart, you know, you should be very wealthy, and and you're sitting there, and like, nothing works for you, you know, it's like, so when is that going to, so the whole thing is, is that um, the chart is, is always rotating, and um, I actually now look at about five different doshas, and I try to find confluence in all of them, because um, Vinfotri dasha, which is the one that people use most, is not really... Well, you, you can get answers from it, but, you know, you have to kind of pull your teeth on it. And there are other doshas that are just easier for getting the results that you want, like chara dasha I use a lot and things like that. But these, the bottom line is, so I always start by looking at the doshas, is the period um, good for money now? And then you have to kind of rotate the houses around the dasha lore. That's, people forget that, for those of you who know astrology, uh, you have to kind of... Um, one of the techniques is that, you know, our lives are always changing. Sometimes our relationship works, we go into another cycle, we get a divorce, our relationship doesn't work because the house, the, the chart is always rotating around the new, the new dasha. And if you don't rotate the chart, then you can't see what's going to happen in that period. So I always start by looking at the period and how, how do the money houses and, 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 and you know, kind of line up. Uh, sometimes we look at things like, um, you know, usually, like I said, people want to know, um, you know, how to, how to make a living, how, how can I make the most money or something like that, or their periods of, um, you know, and I'll, I'll look at the 11 from the Ura Lagna, but I, ha I have a whole class on um, f uh, finding your life purpose, and people often ask me, well, what should I do? <laughs> what should I be doing to make the most money? And I, and I tell people sometimes, you know, sometimes our purpose is just to be, is our relationship and getting it right with our children. And that may be our purpose in this incarnation, you know, how we earn a living, you know, may not, may, not, may, may not make us happy, but, you know, it's something that, you know, we do. We may have more planets prominent in the sixth house. We work for an employer. We hate it, but we it takes care of our family, you know, so it gets very kind of complex. Um, and, you know, I, I, I actually don't like... Um, you know, people sometimes come to me, you know, when will I make a lot of money? Well, I, I, I like to empower people to kind of shift their karma and do remedies so that they can be aware of their patterns and change it. I don't, I don't like to, you know, I, I think people who are especially on a spiritual path who, who meditate and who are even aware of Vedic astrology, I mean, if they come to me, they're a little bit ahead of the game. They should, you know, they should be in a transformational place. And I, I'm really into kind of transformational astrology. It's like, what are the patterns that you got from your family that are blocking money? What remedies can you do to kind of get through it? And then what practical steps can you do so that you can, you know, get a good job and, and make it? And are there cycles that are suggesting that, yeah, you'll get a tailwind here and you'll get a headwind there, but you still have to make it make money when you have a, a headwind, you know, you know, like it, it may be harder. Yes. You're in a, you're in a Saturn period. You're going to have to work really hard, but by the end, you know, it's going to come through, but you've got to just stick it, stick it out. You know, where, you know, where it's gone, you're going into a Jupiter period and you've got Jupiter in the ninth and it's in cancer. And, and, you know, it's, you know, like anything you do is just automatically going to kind of, just you know blossom and people will be throwing money at you but but you know it doesn't that doesn't happen very much most of the time the people that come to me have problems you have to do something about it you have to change your life you have to become aware of what you're doing wrong you have to you know so before we the, get into that barry because you're kind of jumping ahead here with remedies and before we talk about remedies i just want for listeners to uh, just back up a bit where barry was talking about uh, he was using the word dashas Dashes basically means um, circumstance. What circumstances are you in? And basically, as he said, it's a way of rotating the chart of similar to Western techniques of time lords. It's how basically the chart is progressed, whether you do it with planets or signs that you have a birth chart and that's kind of like a static thing. And then you have these uh, progressed charts or planets that progress and that show the timing, which are used extensively in Indian astrology by the way. So that is so important because you want to see what's active. So like you say, people are coming to you when they have a cycle that is probably challenging financially, right? Because they want to sort it out. So now let's get into the remedies and how would you approach it in terms of what would you start doing with remedies? And again, I know this is a huge topic. We could do a whole podcast on this, but basic things that people can do. Okay, so one of the things that I think everybody can do, I mean, some people don't like Vedic remedies. And so one of the things that I often recommend is tithing. And my dad taught me tithing from a young age. I mean, we didn't have 
anything but whatever we had he would you know donate you know he would send our old clothes you know to people who didn't have clothes he helped me took, he took my favorite bike at age 13 and then i had stopped riding and gave it to a little kid in the neighborhood i mean it just is important you know giving giving is everything and when we give the universe comes back to us um it comes back to us and so um tithing is tithing is everything i mean um some people even if you have nothing to tithe, you can tithe service. I mean, you can help somebody out. You can help somebody out. So sometimes I'll look at the planets in a chart that are having problems, and I'll recommend, you know, the, recommend remedies, um, specific remedies for tithing. And you can get very specific. So, like, let's say you've got Sun in the twelfth house, um, and you have um, issues with confidence because you weren't. Um, you know, maybe your father wasn't there properly, um, and that's blocking you from getting a job, a promotion that you need, or something like that. Then, I, then you, simple remedy might be to help a mother who doesn't have a, a husband, and and help father her children by spending time with him. That would be kind of a simple remedy that would involve money. You could donate to to donate to charities that support mothers that don't have husbands, so that they, you know, there are things you can you can do. They're very specific things you can do and, and you can get very creative about it. Um, if you have problems with, you know, Jupiter, you might, you know, which is the good luck planet, and, and you may need to donate to, to gurus and spiritual organizations and teachers and, and you know, um, on, on a Thursday. Um, and you can get very specific. I mean, I you can look at even nakshatras and, and you can get very specific with, I have a whole class on this in my course. Um, but it's quite fascinating, and, and I, you know, when I've done it for myself, I know um, I have I have a configuration where I need to actually help my son because it's eight houses away from um, it's in it's in Pisces, but it, it's in a six eight relationship from Leo, and and one of the things I realized, you know, because it was in Pisces, I needed to help uh, I needed to help children, so I always donate to children's charities, but then I realized I needed to actually father and support children. So there's an organization that teaches entrepreneurship in, in high school so that you can help youth become good business people. I think I forgot what it's called, but I just realized it was like the perfect charity for supporting my chart. And I noticed that when I started donating regularly to them, like, you know, sales and income just increased dramatically. So we can, we can look specifically at blocks in the chart for money, and then we could come up with tithing remedies or, you know, specifically for them i mean you know if the moon's a problem you know sometimes you have to support um you know mothers you know single mothers who you know or things like that or um, you know, um if, if mars is a problem you know you know um and is blocking money sometimes you have to donate to to veterans on a tuesday you know so it's the very specific things that you can do and you can get more specific you can look at the aspects and the conjunctions and the nakshatras and you can even get more specific and it's very powerful very powerful because I know myself personally that I mean if you were to look at my chart and you see the you know financial difficulties I've had in my life when on paper it seems that way in reality my experience has been has been different because of astrology largely that I've been able to look at it in in a different way and also be very grateful for what I have I remember like Sinead O'Connor years ago I had an album called I do not want what I do not have um, and it was like this sense of you know, I always had this sense of, I have everything I want, actually, you know, I, I have everything I want. And that kind of attitude even um, shifts everything around, right? That, that kind of different way of looking at things. Whereas really, when we're always wanting for something, even if we're a billionaire, that is a very poor state of mind, when you think about it, right? If you have everything you want, I mean, that's, that's the happiest way to be, right? There's, there's no desire there for any more. Um, so I guess we have to, I guess, think about wealth and what that is as well. And of course, in my chart, anyway, my um, second house is, is, is Sagittarius, and it's very much about uh, knowledge as well. So if we draw that back to Lakshmi and the different, you know. Right, um, wealth is knowledge. Yeah, wealth that's is, the wealth one is I knowledge. In, in, my, in my books, all of the wealth that I've, or all of the knowledge I've accumulated over the years unless I go and hit my head tomorrow, I'm, that's, that's one thing that worries me. <laughs> and I just like, forget it all. But I feel like that's all like wealth stored in my head. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My wealth is my library, you know, my astrology yeah, yeah. library. <laughs> <laughs> so now um, moving on to the next topic, because we, we do have to mention this, which is, you know, 
I think a lot of people are going to be thinking about this, talking about it, and maybe we'll all be doing in the future, and that's crypto. So what are your thoughts on crypto and, and the astrological view of it? Put it yeah, um, well, if, you know, crypto is, you know, is a mathematical entity, you know, it's, it's you know, if you, people know how it's derived by computers, you know, creating these complex mathematical formulas. So that's, that's K2, you know, K2 is math. And so cryptos are ruled by K2. And um, it's interesting. I was just thinking that Saturn has been aspecting K2. It hasn't been helping the crypto agent. <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, so, so we have to look at the Karka. And we do have a chart for Bitcoin going back to October 2009, I think it is, or something like that. It's a Sag rising chart ruled by Jupiter. And it was, you know, it was very easy to predict crypto crypto with that chart jupiter was you know in sag and then jupiter was in capricorn in the second house and i knew last year when jupiter went to aquarius the third house which is not which is a very weak place for jupiter to transit that cryptos were going to be in trouble and jupiter had already been in aquarius before this is the second time it went into aquarius last november and so i told people get out of cryptos you know and they you know got out of mine a week before the a week after the market top and, and, you know, I said, well, at least until, at least let's see where it goes until Jupiter goes into Pisces, you know. Um, and lo and behold, Jupiter went into Pisces, and, and it still, it didn't really help that much. And it, it surprised me initially, but, you know, I just kind of, you know, I do understand. I, I, I think, you know, cryptos have been in, in a bubble. And when we historically look at bubbles, I mean, most of you, some of you were around when we had the NAS, uh, when we had the, the, the dot-com bubble. And that's when, like, all these stocks, these internet stocks, which didn't have any value, went to the moon, and then they all kind of all crashed. And at that time, NASDAQ 100, which had a lot of these internet stocks, crashed 80%. And there have been a lot of other bubbles. And kind of this, the rule is, is that when you have, when you have a bubble, which we had, you know, because cryptos went, you know, you know, um, the market will often correct 80%. <laughs> so we're, we've gone about 75%. So um, Bitcoin probably will have to go to 13,000 to hit 80%. You know, maybe may be a little bit lower. And, and I'm calculating that maybe that'll happen until December. And I'm not sure it's going to recover. I mean, when markets crash, they don't always just like go straight up again to new highs. And I don't, uh, there may be a future in cryptos. I worry that governments don't like cryptos because cryptos compete with their worthless paper, you know, their bonds and their dollars and things like that. So you kind of, um, you know, you've seen government kind of regulate things out of existence. Gold, you know, was the fly to commodity, you know, in the depression. And suddenly Roosevelt said, you know, regulated it out of business. So I don't, um, I think cryptos will come back. I, I don't know if they're going to, you know, go to the moon. And it's a speculative thing. You know, if you if you put all your savings into, th think your whole life is dependent on cryptos going to the moon, you know, you're going to be disappointed because, you know, making money is about, investing wisely accumulating it in your bank i mean cryptos to me are speculative you know you that's a good point because it draws it back to what we were speaking of earlier when you talk about you know the different well it's it's down to the individual as well in the chart like what have you got going on in your second house or wherever like is it saturn is it like slow and steady is it like you know is it more speculative and sort of like you know Rahu real highs and real lows, right? It all depends on the individual. But let's talk about what I'm sure people really want to hear about because we wouldn't really have, uh, we wouldn't, we couldn't say we're having a podcast about um, financial astrology without talking about forecasts. Let's face it, and more long term because people would really want to hear about it. So in terms of like a long term forecast, because obviously what's going on right now, people are worried, right? And so people want to, I guess, hear about where is this likely to go. Okay, so um, I've been timing the stock market using, using doshas, these kind of time cycles since 1987, and um, I've been very good at it. I used to even be able to time it to the day, but um, the New York Stock Exchange, which was founded in 1792, that chart still works. Unbelievable, May, I think May 21st or something, 1792. Um, but we're in a Mercury dasha, and um, last time we had a Mercury dasha, the nice thing is that doshas repeat. So Last time we had it, they don't repeat exactly, but last time we had a Mercury Dasha was between uh, 1897 and 1913, which was not really, if you study historically, that was not really a great uh, period for the United States. And the stock market, um, um, you know, uh, there were a lot of banking crises during that time, and, and, and there were, you can study the history of the, of the U.S. But anyway, um, using the Dasha system, um, the stock market 
it does not have a, a low until October, November of, of next year, 2023. And people have been so used to this market going straight up, you know, since 2009, you could just buy stocks and hold them and they would come back. Well, you know, I, I've studied the history of the stock market. You know, you do get corrections. When you get these corrections, they often go two or three years. And even when we got into 2020, I said, well, we're likely to have a correction for two or three years because that's, 1980 to 1982, we had a big correction. 2000 to 2003, we had a big correction. 2007 to 2009, we had a big correction. So, you know, it's just these, these corrections take two or three years. And so if you buy too early, you know, you're going to get killed. And, and some of these stocks look incredibly cheap, you know, unbelievable. But, you know, some of these stocks have fallen 80%, you know, um, stocks that should have value. And people think, well, I've got to buy it. Well, it's, you know, um, I don't think it's over now. We will get balances. I, 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 one thing that's interesting now, short term, is that Saturn is changing signs. It's going into Capricorn, and Saturn, when it's Sunday or changing signs, it has tends to create more fear. And the last time Saturn was at twenty nine to one degree, 20, 29 to zero degrees, Capricorn, was April twenty first to the twenty eighth. The stock market fell. 10% during that, that time period. So we've got another two, it's just starting next week, we're gonna be going into that again. And so I, I don't, you know, people are thinking, oh, the market's bottom. I don't think it's done. And even if, um, and as you know, we've got the big mess with Mars Rahu, Iran is coming up and we don't, who knows what the hell that's gonna bring. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's even a, a trader's buying point until the middle of April, uh, of August. And then, and I'm not sure, you know, again, I, you can, if, you have, if you're an investor, you know, if you're a trader, yeah, there might be a place to buy stocks and make, you know, but most people are investors and you're, you know, you have to wait for the 2023 low. That's the stock market. Now, a lot of other things are in bubbles too. I mean, you know, a lot of bubbles are bursting now. I just, you know. Um, what about this point that the stock market is, is not the economy, you know, that people can right. Feel, right? Well, obviously the economy is a whole lot more than the stock market. Um, and, and, yeah, thank you. You know, Jupiter and Pisces, and, you know, Gary and I both saw this. Pisces is, you know, pie in the sky is connected to Neptune. Jupiter was conjunct Neptune. You know, whenever you have Jupiter and Neptune conjunct, you get inflation, you know, and, and Jupiter doesn't get out of Pisces until um, April 2023. Um, I don't I don't even think the inflation, I think inflation is going to go on beyond that. And Neptune's still there in, in Pisces um, for for you know, for a number of years. And, um, you know, as Gary and I were talking before the broadcast, sometimes Saturn-Neptune aspects will kind of create deflation um, and we'll get a Saturn-Neptune conjunction. But, you know, we get, you know, we get these cycles with um, inflation and recession and, and things like that. But um, the problem is the world is in a huge kind of mess. The governments have been kind of manufacturing money out of thin air. It's not backed by production. Um, we had, you know, the, $15 trillion of debt in the world. You know, Europe has been an absolute mess, you know, buying up their own bonds to keep their, you know, a, you know economy afloat. And so the, the, there's been this, there's been a bigger mess than we've had in the depression in terms of how, people have been out of control in terms of printing money and being irresponsible about budgets all across the world. And there's very few countries that have, you know, been able to, to be fiscally responsible. And so, you know, Saturn doesn't like that. <laughs> and Saturn's going to kind of say, you know, you got to learn how to live with your budget. You've got to kind of, you know, um, make sure everything works. You can't spend money you don't have. These are basic things for personal life. Governments have been just been out of control. And, and so the whole world is going to go through a huge kind of correction around us. And, and it may go on a whole lot longer than anybody wants to imagine. Um, well, this I, is the thing, isn't it, for us astrologers, Barry? We're at this point now where we'll, we, we've had a pandemic, we're seeing a war and the potential of like major war breaking out. Right, right. Um, and really the gloves are off. And so I think if we don't make predictions about things like this kind of catastrophic sort of economic downfall and, you know, and also the upside of that and possibly whatever it might be, cryptos or whatever else coming in on, on online to kind of replace systems that are breaking down. Well, people will look to us and say, well, you didn't tell us, you didn't warn us because we could, apart from this, a more immediate time frame, which maybe we should just come back to and just reemphasize this period is really for the next couple of years, quite volatile. In terms of the long term, have you looked at the Saturn 
Uranus conjunction coming up by the beginning of next decade as a conjunct Taurus and then exactly in Gemini. I mean, yeah. for me, that reading is, well, it's, it's going to be dire. volatile, but it's going to be, you know, Jupiter back to Capricorn with Pluto. Like, so it's going to be, if it hasn't reset by then, I'd use the word reset. <laughs> if right. it hasn't reset by then, it's going to have to, right? Right. Whole, yeah, a whole different kind of economic system has to kick in. Yeah, right? we, we have kind of a, you know, you could get really dire about 2030 to 2032. I mean, I mean, we, we the, the thing is that um, the world, the world is, is kind of, you know, it's, it is a mess and, and we haven't had good leaders to kind of, you know, where, where are, you know, in, in the past when we've had crises, we've had really strong leaders to kind of come out of, you know, to help move us through our crises. I mean, you know, whether it was FDR or Churchill or, you know, uh, Kennedy even, uh, we haven't had any good leadership in the world for a long time. And all these leaders are kind of politically corrupt. Um, you know, the leaders, leaders aren't taking care of us. So I, I don't know, something larger has to happen where people, you know, where government, governments are going to have to kind of change dramatically and we have to reelect responsible people who care about our world to make good decisions or we're in trouble. Now, um, you know, looking at the US, looking at 2024, in the US chart, we have a Pluto return. It's when Pluto takes about 248 years or so to go through the whole zodiac. And when the United States was born, um, Pluto was at seven degrees or I think six or seven degrees of a queer, of a Capricorn. And um, Pluto's gonna, gonna hit that point um, in April of 2024. And at the same time, um, um, we have a total solar eclipse in April of, of uh, 2024 going across the United States, you know, like it did in was it 2017 or 18, where it's actually seen in the United States where the, you, you know, the U.S. is going to go dark in the middle of the day, um, at the April 2000. So that, so to, and there are three other major events happening that month. So to me, April 2024 is like a big turning point for the United States. In the past, when we've had Pluto returns, it's usually kind of a change of civilization. Now the US has been the head of the world for a while and that baton has passed. The UK used to be the head of the, lead of the world and then it passed the baton to the US after World War II. China wants to become the head of the world. They're in a Virgo period with an exalted Mercury. <laughs> they're, they're gonna make it, be, you know, in the ninth house. They're gonna make it because they're just, um, you know, they, they, they're doing everything to become the center of the world. So you can see that kind of happening. So it seems like the baton is going to pass from the US to China, I think. In, at the same time, um, can the US rise up and make the changes it needs to make um, so it doesn't, you know, really kind of turn into a mess? Um, you know, I, we don't know. The answer is, you know, there is some free will and, and, and will the people kind of say, Let's get rid of our corrupt leaders and let's we need to do something you know but um in the history of rome for example rome peaked you know at the last pluto return and and, and it decayed it didn't totally die but it just kind of you know it got invaded it got taken over on some level and it just never was the same again um and, and there's a lot of corruption in rome at the same time so pluto returns can can be a big transformational re cycle and it, it will bring huge transformation for the United States. It could be positive transformation if if the people of the US rise up in consciousness. If not, you know, it, it could be very messy, you know, and the US has a, such an important say in the rest of the world. So and I'm talking about the US because I know the US and I'm from the US, but you know, we could work on individual countries sometime. But it's, but it's, also the US, uh, the dollar is the reserve currency. So if that is no longer the reserve currency, that is going to have a huge impact on the economy for sure. Right. That's happening. That's China and Russia. Of, that's part of the Pluto return for the U.S. in 2024, which then leads to a Saturn-Neptune conjunction. Uh, which, you know, if we're having a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction now, and the inflation, you know, that is likely deflation, which right. I imagine follows inflation. Um, but then, in the more immediate time, and then let's say draw that out to the sort of long-term next decade. We look at it more positively that is you know obviously uh, a complete change in the financial structure and the reserve currency and all of that but also then a complete change in how we trade 
Right. right. I mean, whether cryptos will take over the world, I don't know. I, I do think, I mean, there are forces that are trying to change the world economic system and, and um, you know, whether they'll succeed, whether the way they wanted to succeed is, I mean, the difference now is because, you know, countries can create helicopter money, you know, money used to be physical coinage, you know, and you had to, you know, but, you know, in Rome didn't have uh, manufactured uh, credit cards. So, you know, the solution now is if, you know, if, if the world were, were to collapse, your country would say, well, we're going to give you a, um, we're going to print money out of thin air. And you, you know, if you're a good boy, you, you know, you get your allowance of $3,000 a month on your credit card and buy your groceries. And, and if you're not a good boy, then, then, you know, maybe, maybe we won't give you as much or we won't give you anything, you know, and China has already kind of done that. They have this kind of point system. And if you've seen, there's a famous uh, Black Mirror episode, season three, I think episode one called um, Nose oh, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. it's amazing. It's a, it's kind of, it was, it was a play on what happens when your life is dictated by your social score. I mean, if people don't like the way you act and they put down your social score, then you suddenly can't function in society. And China's doing that already. And there are people- Well, actually the world is doing that already in, a, in essence, really with social media. Right, right. It, it is already happening. It's just that it would probably, like you say, expand out into actually how you can, how we can trade if it's all digital currencies. So we have to be mindful of that, which basically means at the end of the day, what is always going to be of value is owning a piece of land, owning, owning your piece. Right. I agree. I, owning, you know, you know, my 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 dream was, you know, have a have a place in the country with some farmland, solar, you know, water source, solar solar panels, wind power, and just you know, grow your own food and try to be away from whatever you're happy. I don't know. It's kind of a dream. I don't know. You know, you could do it in certain areas, but um, lots lots more people are doing it. End of the, end, end of the day, if you're talking about paper money or digital, it's not food in your mouth. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the second house. It's Taurus. It's what you store. It's, you know, going back to our Hungarian society, how much, how much food can you grow and how much food can you store for the winter and do, you know, and things like that. You know, I, I don't want to get that dire, but it's, it's, it seems like when I look at the stock market, it looks like it could come back from this low into next year. Um, and so I, it may be that the forces that be will somehow you know, have some type of recovery for a few years, maybe into 2026 is what it looks like. And then when Saturn goes into areas, I think we're just in real trouble. Um, Interesting how you say October, November, 2023, because I did my own study on this. I did some research on all the stock market crashes since 1900. And I saw this pattern <laughs> repeating over and over for the major ones. And that was a Mars Ketu conjunction. Every time the major stock market crashes, and lo and behold, what are we having in October, November, twenty twenty three? A Mars Ketu conjunction. Yeah, so that might be that might be like a climax, you know. But we've been the market's been falling, you know. If you look at stock market charts now, I mean, you know, I mean, look at you know, m many core stocks have fallen 50, 60, 70 percent, and you wouldn't think these were big names. Everybody thought, you know, if you owned this stock, you know, you were you were fine. But um, you know. Um, but it, it does seem to be climaxing into that because there are other things obviously leading up to that that we, we are we are looking at. It's not just the Mars K2 conjunction, but you know, that's something for people listening to think about, you know, the potential in October, November 2023. So, but in the more immediate time frame, maybe to wrap it up, we are seeing this, you mentioned it earlier, this Mars Uranus Rahu conjunction in Aries, and then Aries then moving into Taurus and then going back into Taurus, retrograding in Taurus for the end of the year into next year so obviously there's some major things happening this year that kind of lead to that further down the line so what is what's your take on this triple conjunction well um when i've looked at, I, without uranus when i've looked at mars um rahu conjunctions in the past i often see a lot of violence um, and I see kind of mob violence and, it, you know, it's not going to happen everywhere, but it, it tends to kind of, and it depends where it's happening. I mean, look, look what's happening in the Netherlands. Now the farmers are dumping manure in front of the legislators offices because they're being legislated out of business. I mean, so people get angry when you do crazy things. Um, so I, I don't know exactly where it's going to, I, I've seen like racial riot, riots, riots, you know, during Mars Rahu conjunctions, I've, there's a lot of, I read a whole article on it. Um, there are a lot of things that can happen with Uranus. It can, you know, there are a lot of, you know, we, we're having, 
Uranus brings in electricity. I mean, already we're having today came out the state of Texas just said, well, we're, we may have to shut down refineries because we need them the power to run people's air conditioners in their homes so they don't boil, you know, so, you know, we're, we have power outage problems already and we have a we have huge energy problems all over the world. Suddenly you have this boiling hot summer, you get power outages, you get power plants. I think that's certainly something you'd expect in a Mars Rahu Uranus conjunction. Um, and then the subsequent Mars transit in Taurus might hint therefore and the retrograde um at you know during winter further um you know need for conservation of energy while yeah, people are trying we to know we have homes. a crisis we have a crisis in europe around natural gas and, and fuel and and it's you know they know it already and and they're not even like doing anything about it they're they're playing the green pol politics and green is fine but nobody planned really well i mean if you want to get rid of coal and and and, and oil i mean we love we love you know there isn't enough lithium to make all the batteries you need to make enough electronic cars to replace replace them so i mean in concept it's absolutely idealistic and wonderful it's a jupiter and pisces idealistic fantasy you know getting your electronic tesla you know and your electronic truck it's absolutely admirable but you know it, it probably takes 20 years of planning to really get it done you know and we probably have to find better build better batteries and 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 you know to even to make it a reality you know actually there's one thing i saw today about uh, solar panels how you know unfriendly they are to the environment but that there's this new i don't know what the technology is or the substance that is not yeah, yeah, as see, damaging they're... yeah to the tech uh, to the environment and it's cheaper to make and it could be like really brought out throughout the world so there always are for whatever is going on in any crisis there are always are innovations coming up behind it whether they actually come main become mainstream or not is the question one thing i and i looked at about this triple conjunction of mars rahu and uranus well actually mars uranus conjunction together with a jupiter neptune conjunction in 1945 saw hiroshima being bombed right. the atomic right. bomb like let's now the, the the way i read that was rahu this time in a way blocks the energy of mars because what is Rahu? Rahu is fear. Right. fear. The fear of that being a potential that, you know, it might actually um, prevent that from happening this time around. And then at the same time, then it just makes it so volatile because you've got this really spike in Mars energy, but it's not able to express itself. Where does it go out? Where does it express itself? And maybe in all very many unpredictable kinds of ways, right? So that's, that's my positive reading of it, I guess, that other than... The, the Rahu, this could have been potentially a nuclear fallout or accident or something. Uh, and well, it, 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 it's messy. I mean, we've been looking at this for a while. I mean, I, um, you know, I certainly hope that, um, um, you know, it, it, it's just kind of a big turning point for the next, you know, nine months. And, and you know, what exactly happens with it? I don't know. I mean, there's certainly going to be all kinds of political fallouts and, and um, uh, food crises. I mean, we have, we have a lot of things that have been building up food crises electronic crises, um, internet, it could be the internet could go out with Uranus or Mars, Rahu, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they're kind of, um, there are all kinds of potential things, and you don't, I don't want to build fear, you know, I, I, I've actually tried to move away from an astrology of fear, I think it's just a matter of, you know, we've, you know, people, people have been warning us about, you know, starting to grow your own food and storing more food and taking money out of your stock, you know, you know it's good to be prepared, um, at the same time, it's just a good thing to be self-sufficient. But you know, we always have to understand that we're taken care of um, by God, and but we have to be smart. You know, I think that's a really good point to leave it on, Barry, because one of the things that you know, when I have been through challenges in the past um, financially, and and I sat with it for any length of time, I, I realized that actually, wait a minute, I've been held, I've been okay, I'm I'm here on the planet, you know, I'm surviving, I'm doing well, not just surviving. And, and so any of my worries really are, it's kind of like the Rahu end of the spectrum, isn't it? It's sort of like that sort of, in reality, you know, you, you're fine, you know? So it's that greed of Rahu as well that can show this kind of, uh, do you really need all of that? Hoarding and prepping, yeah. And, and we have to remember Jupiter is really strong in Pisces. And so God's grace will support whatever is going to happen. You know, I think... Um, um, I mean, it's, we, we would like it to be aspecting Mars, um, but, but um, you know, at least, um, and Rahu and Uranus, but at least, you know, at least it's there, you know, it's not, 
it's not you know it's it's there it is there and i think we can tap into it i think you're right so um let's maybe leave it on that positive note i know that we've talked about things that we couldn't avoid talking about for sure but i think that you you do have this way of approaching uh the remedial measures as well that's really helpful for individuals and realizing that we do have individual charts and experiences of this that there is a global experience but that we have our own uh, experience and so i think if anyone wants to get in contact with barry that's a good way to go and you can learn about that uh, not just his fortune cast uh, website but also um his astrology readings where he you know will help you with all of these remedial measures whether it's um tithing specific to your chart or any any other remedies that he might offer so thank you so much barry for coming on the podcast yes thanks for having me gary so thank you for listening to the podcast and thank you to my guest, Barry Rosen. If you'd like to learn more about Barry Rosen's work, you can go to his websites. His market timing website is fortucast.com. That's F-O-R-T-U-C-A-S-T, fortucast.com. His astrology website is appliedvedicastrology.com. My own website here is timelineastrology.com. If you'd like to become a patron and get more in-depth astrology, I write daily reports for patrons as well as monthly forecasts and sign-based forecasts. You can go to timelineastrology.com or patreon.com forward slash timelineastrology. Okay, thank you so much for listening to this podcast all the way through to the end and until next time.